I'm Woody from Dive Talk, and I have the absolute pleasure again to have another riveting story from Ed Sorensen. We're here at Cave Adventures. I've been doing some training, and there's no way I can't uh, interview you when I have that opportunity. So a rare moment is this is about all you're going to hear from me. This is an amazing story. Ed was telling me about it. Just set it up in terms of time frame and location, and then... Man, wait till you guys hear this. This is unbelievable stuff. So <clears throat> this was uh, 2012, and normally it was at Jackson Blue Springs in uh, Blue Springs in Mariana here. And normally Blue Springs pumps out about 160 million gallons of water a day. So there's the flow. You've seen it. It's quite substantial. Definitely. During 2012, it was all the way down from 160 to 180 million down to less than nine. It was barely flowing at all. Um, and there was a team of three guys that had come down from the Midwest. And one of my students uh, that had just finished, he was full cave, but he just finished the side mount class, um, was looking for a dive partner. These guys let him go out with them to twin and hole on the wall. The next day, they're all gonna go to Jackson Blue. They're gonna do a specific jump. Um, the, I don't think they were real familiar with the system and they ended up taking the wrong jump. It was side mount only and the, the lead two divers were in back mount. The third diver of that group was in side mount and then my student was in fourth position also in side mount. They go in, it's big enough, they turn, it starts getting smaller. Um, they knew that this jump had a couple of restrictions, but these were way worse than they thought. The lead diver gets stuck and there's very little flow in there, a lot of clay, and he's trying to get through thinking that it's gonna come around. Um, <clears throat> and it's just getting worse and worse. He pops through that restriction, gets ahead of the silt cloud, um, only to find another restriction up there. So he's trying to get through that. The second diver is now stuck in a restriction that he just cleared. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse. Now my student, the last one in, by that time it's clear back to him and he tugs on the guy in front of him and says, I'm out of here. So he turns the, the, the next side mount diver He's trying to signal his buddy who just popped through the restriction and now he can't reach him, can't see him, it's zero viz. So he turns and exits. By this time, the lead diver is now up to his third restriction, still fighting and kicking his way through. It's just getting worse and worse. By this time, it's spreading throughout the whole system. Yeah. And then the second diver, when he gets through the second nasty restriction and he's now trying to follow the line at zero viz he can't find his buddy in front of him um, he turns and decides he's out of there now he's stuck in the restriction going the other way and by the time he got out the three of them all got together by main line they'd followed their jump line back to the gold line and now the main tunnel is four or five foot visibility and it's getting worse and worse by the minute. <clears throat> so they think, well, this comes out up here further. So they go up, put in a reel and start going, but they don't know where they're at because by this time now the whole cave shit out and it's just zero biz. So they're just going around and now they're bumping into each other. Now they're tangling each other up in their lines and they decide we got to get out of here. So they looked as long as they could and still have enough gas for their exit. So one of them, now they're trying to decide what to do and they're trying to communicate with wet notes. And the one guy says he's going to stay and look and the other two are going to exit. Okay. So they exit and as soon as they exit, um, they yell to a guy that's suiting up at the pavilion, you know, call Ed, we need him here now. So they called the shop and I was sitting here having a meeting with Bobby Franklin from Underwater Light Dude. And 
Um, Frank comes running down the stairs, lost diver, lost diver, lost diver. So we start heading to the park. Bobby wants to go in with me. <clears throat> I told him I don't take anybody on a rescue or a recovery. He wants to help. So I said, you can stay in the cavern. And when I bring the body up, you can take it out to the sheriff's department while I decompress. Because in your mind, at that point, it was going to be a body. At least that's what you think. Yeah, they had been there so long that okay. they barely had enough gas to get out. Okay. And it's another over a half an hour from the time I get the call till I'm suited up and in the water. Yeah. Um, which was an amazing time due to my guys being, you know, right on the spot. And they're getting all my stuff together, tanks, regulators, and everything while I'm putting a dry suit on. So I got in the water really fast, but I'm pretty sure it's a body recovery. So I go in, they tell me where there's a jump line to where they were. I go in, I scooter into there. And as soon as I'm, I'm in the cavern and it's maybe seven, eight foot visibility. As soon as I'm dropping down the chimney, it's getting worse. As soon as I get to the bottom, I can barely see past the end of my scooter. So I'm just scootering right alongside the gold line and I almost ran into their jump line. So I swam the scooter up to the jump, clipped it off and started going in. And it's complete zero in there. And I'm just feeling around. Now, when you get right up next to the ceiling, sometimes you can have a couple of inches of visibility, sometimes a foot, sometimes you might be able to see 18 inches. And anything's better than nothing, because usually when somebody runs out of gas, they're floating. Um, and so it's an easy way to find them. I'm searching this tunnel all by hand. I gotta hold the line and go all the way over here into wedgy spots in case he's stuck somewhere over here, up here. And I do this throughout the entire jump. When I get to the end of the jump line, through all the restrictions, now there's no more line. So I get a safety reel out and I start doing a grid search pattern and it's all by feel. And every so often I'll stop and just listen. I'm listening for any kind of a banging on a tank. Uh, even if they're just breathing, usually I can hear somebody breathing 20 or 30 feet away. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and I hear nothing. And I just keep going and it's taking quite a while. Are you, are you, I mean, you can't see, right? They so can't see. Feel, Everything right. is just going so, yes. slow by feel. I, I've got to feel floor to ceiling, floor to ceiling. Now, <clears throat> in the really muddy parts, I'm not doing the biz any good either, but it's zero, zero. So, <clears throat> um, at a certain point, something just told me, you've passed him. And I don't know what, why, or how. And I just start turning around. Some sometimes I think I, I on these you know some of these you know multiple rescues I've done. It's almost if it's not divine intervention, I don't know what it is because instinct. Or some something. people say, "Oh, you're just lucky." Uh, maybe, but I think um, who knows. I like that. I, some, I, I like that. Thought. Somebody tells me something tells me yeah. you passed him. Turn around. So I'm going back and I get up there by the ceiling and I'm looking around. I search some more, I get up by the ceiling, and the ceiling kind of disappears. And I can see some clearer water over here. So I get up there, and now I can see four or five feet in some places, 18 inches others. And then up here, I see just a wall of brown. And I'm like, oh shit, he's up there. And I know that there's a really nasty crevice up there. And it just kind of goes along and it opens up in one spot about this big. That's the only place he could have gotten through in doubles. There's a line supposed to be there and it isn't there. I can't find it. I get up there, I find the crack and I'm trying to figure out where I can fit through. And I've got my reel in my hand and I'm feeling this. And I just know if there's a panic diver on the other side of this crack, he's going to tear my head off when I come up through there. <laughs> and I... And I stopped and I listened for a minute. I don't hear anything. I go up through this crevice. And as I'm going up, I'm now getting sometimes zero, sometimes eight, nine, ten inches of biz. And do you know about how long do you think at that point he's been up there, just to give reference? No, I don't. When I, when I got him out, which will probably be 20 minutes from now in the story, 15 minutes from now. Yeah. Um, he had a 60 foot stop on his computer okay. and it said at that time he'd been in there pretty close to four hours. 
on just a set of doubles. Wow. So, okay. and we're talking 90 feet deep. Yeah. So I'm coming up through this crevice and I'm listening and all of a sudden I see this little teeny blue dot. And I thought that's gotta be his light. So I start heading for it. <clears throat> and as I'm going up, I'm now seeing a really browned out couple of, you know, maybe a foot. And I see the silhouette of two legs hanging down, perfectly motionless with a light hanging down right next to it that should be on his hand, perfectly motionless. And that's his 21 watt HID. So I think to myself, okay, I got a body. And as I get right there, I reach for his leg to pull him down. And about that time I, I exhaled. And I'm looking up and I see him look down at me and I'm like, shit, he's alive. <laughs> so I whip my long hose regulator out. Now, when I started this dive, just on the premise, it may be a rescue. I started on my left short hose cylinder. I've been on my left short hose cylinder this entire time. I'm on two high pressure 100s. That's all I got. Okay. And I have no idea how long I've been in there. I haven't seen my pressure gauges since the cavern. I don't know how low this bottle's getting, but I whip my long hose off and now I can't get up to where his head is. And he's found a little air pocket. It was about maybe two feet across, maybe a little bit. And in the middle, it was kind of shaped like this. In the middle, it was only about this tall. So he had his head up in there. The only spot he could get where his mouth was out of the water because his tanks were empty. And so he's stuck in this one position. He can't move without closing his mouth and not breathing. And who knows what he's breathing? I mean, it's he, gotta exactly. be bad. And this air pocket is small. And for as long as, he, I don't know how long he's been out of gas at this point, I just know, I can't believe he's still alive. Yeah. So I can't get to him. So I'm holding this regulator with my left hand up in this air pocket and my hand kind of disappears here. And I'm thinking, He's not taking it. Is he dead? And I just imagined them looking at me. Because it was pretty bad days. Right. And I'm sitting there doing this. So I get up there and where I can get my head to, it's only about this tall. So I'm looking at him through one eyeball. And I can see, it looks like he's alive. But he's facing this way and I'm over here. And now I need to talk to him. But it's only this tall. So I have to put my lips, I take my regulator out, put my lips almost up to the rocks. And I'm like, are you okay? And then I'm looking at him. And he's like, I'm uh, okay. okay so he's and he's completely, almost comatose. And so now I gotta turn again. And I said, can you do me a favor? Can you put this in your mouth? And I'm still doing this. And he goes, okay. <laughs> and he puts it in his mouth. So now I'm back and I'm trying to tread water with my lips, you know, an inch from the surface, from the ceiling, the rocks, and talk to him and water keeps dumping down my throat. <clears throat> and I'm telling him, I'm gonna get you out. I'm not gonna leave you here, but it's gonna be really bad. I need you to stay calm. Cause the worst thing you can have is him panic and kill me too. And so I'm explaining to him how bad it is, how there's a little teeny crack, the line's missing, and there's only one spot you can fit through, and I gotta find it. So I told him, I'm gonna put you behind me, hanging onto my ankle, and I need you to stay calm. And he said, okay. So we get going, and as soon as we drop out of this air pocket, you know, he's on my regulator, he can't see, and he's squeezing the life out of my leg. That's now, his life. <laughs> now I got my reel and I'm reeling up, but it's line trapped. And um, so I'm just sitting there trying to hold this reel, find this crevice, which is about 10 inches wide, eight inches wide. And it just goes like this. And I'm feeling I'm like, okay, it's gotta be right up here. It's gotta be right up here. And we get to a rock pile. I'm like, oh shit, I missed it. Now I gotta figure out how do I turn hit both of us around so I actually drop down through the crevice because I can fit, he can't. He's still on my leg. Now I'm hanging upside down and he's holding up and I'm trying to do this gymnastic maneuver and now I got to get him off my leg. So I actually have to swing around, bit in half and I 
pulled him off my leg and I put him on my wrist. Okay. So now I'm trying to back him up in zero visibility and this is not going well. And the whole time I'm thinking, how much gas do I have left? I'm trying not to breathe, right. but now I'm working fairly hard. Yeah. And I can hear him just <gasps> And I'm thinking, holy shit, are we gonna have enough gas for this? And I finally find the crack and I can't get him to come head down. For some reason, he would not go head down. And obviously we're in the water, I can't talk to him. So he was just... And I'm like, come on, you're okay, yeah. come on, you're okay. And which sounds, you know, yeah. so who knows what he's hearing. Okay. Who knows what he's comprehending, because he's so out of it. He's got so much hypercapnia and from carbon dioxide. He's got so much uh, hypoxia from lack of oxygen. So finally I realized I can't force him down this hole. So now I have to walk him past the hole. Now I have to pull my hand out from under his hand. Now he's probably thinking, I'm leaving. He's leaving me to die. And I grabbed his feet and I had to pull him down through the crack. And as he's coming down, he's just on me. And I'm just kind of protecting my mask. <laughs> and I'm trying to reassure him, I got you, I got you, I got you, you're okay. And that matters, right? That See, is human contact is so important. And when I pulled my hand away from him, you, I can just imagine how panic-stricken he was, and I just could not have him panic and kill me. And luckily, I think he was so CO2'd out that it, he kept fairly calm. But now we're going. Now, my line goes to the end of that passage. I know the gold line's about 50 feet that way, but I don't know where exactly. So I get another safety out, tie into my reel, and then I start going that way, and all of a sudden he's pulling me back. And I'm like, oh, come on, I don't have time for gas for this. And I'm like, are you okay? Are you okay? And by this time, we've got sometimes two, three, four, five inches of visibility. And he grabs my hand and he puts it over here on his right post. And his long hose was seven feet that way, stuck between two rocks. Oh, no. So, oh, so now I've got to go back, get his regulator out from the rocks, put it around his neck, and we finally get to the gold line. And I still can't see my gauges. And I mean, I've got a couple inches of visibility. I'm trying to see that. Just keep going, keep going. And as we start up the chimney, I start getting into a little bit better viz. I can see, all right, I've, you know, I've got a couple hundred PSI left in my tank. And he's probably got, you know, another hundred on top of that on this tank. I'm like, okay, maybe we make it. And that's when I checked his computer and it says he's got a two minute, 60 foot stop. And I'm like, oh geez, we need to get, we need to go. And at this point, I'm only a couple hundred feet from safety bottle. And about that time, Bobby Franklin's swimming around in the cavern and he sees my light. So he comes swimming over and it's still near zero visibility. And he's going, give me the body. And about that time he sees the guy breathe. Oh, and he's man. like, he's yes. Like, so he's asking me, you know, what, what can I do? And I'm like, mm. <laughs> I, I'm okay. So I told him, go get my scooter. So I left him a wet note and off he went. We get going and when we get to where he had tied, where their team had tied the reel in, that's where they left their auction bottles which I don't recommend anybody. That's 45 feet deep. Auction bottles yeah, can't be deployed below 20 feet. But that's where he had it. Okay. So I clipped it on him and he's trying to switch to it. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah. I get him up into the cavern and I said, now switch. And I'm sitting there with him on this shelf and he's not looking at me. He's just looking straight ahead and he's still barely with it. We're sitting there for probably 10 minutes or so when all of a sudden I see him getting real fidgety and he's got these big eyes and he's looking all around and I'm like, are you okay? And he just keeps, and he's not looking at me, but I can see he's about ready to panic again. I'm like, what's going on? And I grab his gauge. He's got zero gas in his, he's now running out of gas for the second time. So I grab 
my regulator out of my auction bottle, I hand it to him, and I get him on auction, and I've still got decompression to do. So I told him, wait right here, and I swam out, told, and by this time there's hundreds of paramedics, cops, ambulance, firemen, back bystanders. They've got body a body bag stretched out. His friends are there. And I said, give me an auction bottle, give me an auction bottle. And like 30 auction bottles come flying at me. I go back in, I'm sitting with him, and when I brought him out, he was barely with it, but enough to answer in yes or no questions to the paramedics and the sheriff's department and stuff. So it was it was a really good day that um, we actually got to bring another one home. Absolutely. Um, just a couple questions come to mind that I can't help. Number one, did he ever give you the Oh my, I mean, you literally saved my life. A hundred percent he dies if you don't get him. I would be like, you, that's it. I mean, if Ed doesn't get him, it's over. Did he give you that he, ever later or something like that? At the time, he was, I think, still um, very hypoxic, even though he was been on pure okay. oxygen. He was really out of it, confused, um, and he's getting bombarded with questions from the paramedics, um, the sheriff's department, bystanders, his friends, everybody's trying to, yeah. the paramedics are trying to keep people back. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then. It's overwhelming too for him at that point. Uh, my guys were there and they were helping him get out of his gear and we got him out of the water. Then I started gearing down. I went by to check on him before I started taking my dry suit off and the paramedics were busy and I thought, let's let them do their thing. We just packed up and left. Later on, when he came back to the shop, he was um, not talking to anybody really. Um, his buddies were talking a lot. Um, he wasn't talking much at all. And then his phone rang and it was his wife. Apparently he was supposed to call when he gets out of each and every dive. And all I heard as he was walking away was, yeah, honey, um, the dive went longer than expected. Okay. I'll call you back. So obviously you don't want to say anything. <laughs> so, now, it, later on, um, I think they left the next day. Um, about six months later, he came back. Um, I got a call from the shop. I was at the park and they said, you know, he's on his way to the park. He wants to see you. He gave me a big hug, thanked me, um, said I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. So it was nice. Yeah. And I think the final thing I want to say is that these are unbelievable, remarkable, life-saving things that you're doing. And there's no real fanfare. There's no real press. It's not like other ref, the Thai rescue, you know, it's just, it's just for you knowing you can do that like and i think is that what drives you i mean do you do you say to yourself i've i've got this duty because i can do it and there is nobody else that can do it I, i'm just what's in your head with that um well i've never done any of this for thanks um when the yeah. iucr was first formed in 1998 or 99 i was asked to be a part of it i was living in oregon so um, there was two of us, Jeff Law and myself. He was asked to be the regional coordinator for Oregon, Washington, and Idaho because there wasn't very many cave divers back then. Um, <clears throat> not like it is now. I think there was only like three cave divers in the state of Oregon at that time. Okay, wow. So <clears throat> we were supposed to be over Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. Um, and we were told we could never ask for money. This was a volunteer thing. If you want to be a part of it, you know, you're welcome. If you don't, you don't. Um, <clears throat> and um, I did my first recovery, I think, while I was on vacation um, in 1999. Um, and it's everything happened so fast that, um, you know, by the time the the victims taken away by the ambulance um and then all the incident reports are done and everything usually everybody's gone um i don't think i saw the husband of uh that victim uh for years um and he never brought it up i'm sure as heck not gonna 
Um, <clears throat> when I did my first, well, the first rescue I ever got called out for was in 2006. And when I got to him, uh, the, the, the buddy had said he was uh, trapped but had gas. When I got to him, of course, he was deceased. I got him out. I had to go back in. He had dumped his tanks. And when I went back, it had been an hour had transposed by that time or transpired. So I had a couple inches of visibility. He still had 2,500 PSI in his tanks. Had he not panicked and ditched his tanks, I'd have, got, I'd have, I'd have rescued him too. But um, when I did the first rescue, um, the news said it was amazing, incredible. There had been so few in history, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of the cave divers, uh, oh, well, that's nothing. Oh, he got lucky. And I don't know. There's a lot of that um, in the cave community more than I'd like to see. But, you know, hey, if somebody does something great, I'm all for it. Um, but it was, you know, maybe I was lucky. Maybe it was a miracle. Maybe who knows what it was. Then the second one happened. Then the third. Then the... Yeah. Now we're up to six. I mean, yeah. I'm either either really lucky, or I have divine intervention, or I'm at the right. I don't know. It's well, hard to say. then, then I'm, I said it was my final question, but now because you said that, are you gonna train somebody? I mean, there will be a day. I hope it's fifty years from now. But at some point, are you thinking I want to try to? Is there any training in your brain that you think I have a person? Maybe I could start showing how I go about the thinking or the process of doing this. Well, you know, on one hand, when I look back at what training did I get, Henry Nicholson, the, the founder of the IDCRR, um, our entire training was paperwork. This is an incident report. It's not an accident. It's an incident. This is how we fill it out. The sheriff's department's in charge. We're just a vehicle to get them out for them. It's, a, it's always considered a crime scene until it's been cleared that it's not. Okay. Um, and this is how we do things. Nobody ever taught me anything on okay. how to do the recovery. Uh, Lamar Hires and John Jones do all the IUCRR training. At one time, John said that him and Lamar were, you know, thinking about, you know, bringing somebody else in, asked me if I would do it. I said I would. But after one of the, after that extraction um, in the Dominican, I actually talked to Lamar in great detail. And I said, you know, I'm 62 years old now. I said, it's, you know, I can't be traveling all over the world. We got it. We got to have something. So him and I yeah. talked about it. Exactly. But then it went away. Um, I actually talked about it with um, Dean, my head instructor, um, at one point about, hey, what if we have a class? Because now that, remember back in the 90s, there was very, very, very few people side mounting at all. Um, it was a taboo, it was a job specific tool. Um, and now that side mount is the prevalent form of diving, people are going into smaller and smaller places. Yep. Um, and you know, the Dominican Re Republic thing, they, they had 16 or 18 experts over there. And then before they called me and it, there's a need for it. There definitely is. We've talked about it. We haven't done it. Um, but as far as, you know, it's just like the, uh, the rescue of Josh up there when the, mm -hmm. they're, they've got the whole site closed down. They're not letting the UK divers dive for their friends. And they said, we're waiting for an expert out of Florida. So all these people are waiting for an expert out of Florida. When I show up, they rush me into this mobile command center and they said, okay. Now they're thinking the savior is here. Here's our expert. What's your plan? And they're all looking at me. They want to hear this plan so badly from the expert. And I said, I don't have a plan. And I see this look of despair and shock and they go, Oh, uh, what do you mean you don't have a plan? I said, I've been doing this for 25 years. Every one of them's different. So it's I go true, in, yeah. I see what I see. And they're like, well, how long is your dive going to be? I don't know. And they're like, what do you mean you don't know? I'm like, I'll go till I get it done. Or are you going to use their line? Are you going to run your own line? I don't know. And they're probably thinking, does this guy know anything? Are we sure he's an expert? 
But it makes sense. I mean, everyone is so different. It's all yeah. instinct. When I came up with the first yeah. recovery harness yeah. to get him through tight restrictions, when I took Mike over to the Dominican, I'm, I'm showing him this, and he's like, how did you come up with this? I needed it at the time, and it just came to me. So I don't know how to teach instinct mm. to people. We can teach know. them the different harnesses. I can make them for them. I can teach them the why behind how they were developed. I can teach them why in one scenario you might need to pull them backwards feet first and use this harness. Why you might need to pull them this way so you don't pull their arms off. But you just can't teach instinct. So yeah. But if we get some divers trained in extreme uh, small confined space recovery, then maybe the rest will come. Yeah, hopefully we can. Um, thank you, as always. A pleasure, pleasure. Wade. Thanks for having me. And Bye, people. Ed Sorensen, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Bye.